Welcome to Elements of a Garden, a podcast to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Theodore Payne Foundation Native Plant Garden Tour. I'm Evan Meyer, the Executive Director of the Foundation, and today we are going to unravel the threads on a single garden, garden number six, in the Mid Wilshire area. We're going to look at that garden through a lot of different lenses, through the lens of a gardener, the lens of a scientist, the lens of a citizen of the city of Los Angeles. This garden has been created and maintained by Dr. Alex Hall, a UCLA climate scientist and a Theodore Payne Foundation board member. And I think he's the perfect person to really look closely at what's happening in his garden and then look outside the garden and extrapolate to what else that means for our city, for our region, and for our planet. When we came up with a way to organize this podcast, we were thinking, what is really foundational? How can we synthesize big ideas into a neat package? And the idea of elements came up, not the periodic table elements. There's not going to be much discussion of hydrogen or helium, but the elements that came before that, the medieval alchemy elements, as they're known. And I just found that these elements have counterparts in many other cultures, including Hinduism, Buddhism, and you've probably heard them before. Those elements are water, earth, air, fire, and that mysterious ineffable fifth element, sometimes called ether, sometimes called void, or in my favorite way of organizing these elements, heart. I'm not gonna try to fool you. I wasn't sitting there in my uh, academic uh, office thinking about medieval elements. This actually came from a TV show that I liked when I was a kid. Growing up in the 90s, something called Captain Planet, which you may or may not have seen, but it was this very charming um, and kind of kitschy show about a bunch of teenagers around the world who each represented one of those five elements, and they would come together to create a superhero called Captain Planet who would fight against polluters and people who are destroying um, the environment. Today we have a real life environmental superhero with us, Dr. Alex Hall, and I'm really excited and honored to have him and to uh, go down this rabbit hole together and, and think about his garden and the larger context of, of the uh, moment that we're in in 2023. So if you're listening to this during the garden tour, I hope that you're enjoying all the beautiful stops. I hope you make it to garden number six and get to see Alex's garden and meet him in person. If you're listening to this at another time, I hope it can open up some thoughts, ideas, and conversations about the individual versus the collective, about what it means to be alive in this moment and how we can think about our place in a much larger, much more complex uh, world that we live in. So with that, I hope you enjoy Elements of a Garden and get to get elemental thinking about the fundamentals of Alex Hall's garden in Mid Wilshire. a deep subject. We're going to dive deep into the subject of water today and what it means for a native plant garden here in Los Angeles. It's probably one of the most important things to think about as a gardener in LA. And I'm excited to talk with Dr. Alex Hall, climate scientist from UCLA and Theodore Payne Foundation board member about his garden, garden number six in Mid Wilshire. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. It's great to be here. We're honored to have you. Now, Water was a big entry point for you into gardening, right? In my work as a climate scientist, I study climate change impacts, especially in California. And it became very clear to me that water sustainability was an existential threat posed by climate change, especially in Southern California. So I thought, well, I need to redo my landscaping. <laughs> I need to mm -hmm. um, have a garden that, that's conserving water. And so I decided to explore native plants. And that's what got me started, you know, thinking about incorporating native plants into my garden. And ultimately, I completely drank the Kool-Aid and really got obsessed with native plants and, and also the habitat restoration component of a native garden, which is equally important as the water 
conserving properties of it. That's how I got started. Yeah, and I think that story is one that I've heard a lot, that water is this gateway into realizing that the landscape here in Los Angeles is not sustainable. It's not environmentally friendly. And once you go down the water uh, direction and start thinking about, well, how can I save water? Then it opens up this much deeper, bigger picture of what you can do in terms of habitat that you brought up, which we'll, we'll certainly get into over the course of this podcast. But let's stay on water right now. How do you kind of think about water in your garden? Um, garden number six, make sure you go see it. But how do you think about watering your plants? How do you water your plants? And just kind of relate to us your perspective of water as a native plant gardener. Well, I have a rainwater capture system. Um, so I do get the water from my roof and I, I um, temporarily store it in, in a rain barrel, but I have a system of hoses that drains the barrel as, as it fills and the water is distributed into the native garden. So my plants get a lot more water, probably about double the amount of water that they would get with a rainstorm. So you're doing a very environmentally conscious thing and saving water at your home garden, but at the municipal scale across the city of Los Angeles and, and most cities in California that I know of, that's not happening. Can you just kind of explain where's water going when it falls and, and lands here in Southern California as rain? When the water system evolved in the 20th century, the idea was to get rid of all the stormwater and import water for everyone's use. And so basically it's just completely set up to get rid of all the water. And part of that is a flood management issue. When the LA River flooded in the in the 30s, several hundred people lost their homes and I believe there was quite a lot, bit of loss of life. And so the LA River was channelized. And then the other, other waterways like Bolona Creek were also um, channelized. And all the gutters and the houses were set up to just put the water into the street and get rid of it. So we've, we had this legacy water system where um, for the most part, we just don't capture water. Um, so the LA County Flood Control District actually does capture some water from the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains. And, you know, so overall, I think we capture something like 20% of our local water, but we could do a lot more. And individual um, property owners can get started by just making sure that what does fall into their own roofs is stays, um, there. stays there. Well, and the other side of the coin of this is that when the water goes into those storm drains and goes out to the ocean, it's not clean water that's that's going out. It, it sort of becomes this mixed up flow of contaminated water. Um, so there's some interesting stuff out there. There's a place called the Westwood Greenway, which we've featured on past tours that is all about cleaning stormwater and resurfacing it and putting that back into the ground in a, in a cleaned way. So I think, I mean, I hope that we as individuals are doing everything we can in, in whatever ways we can, but I think we also need a lot of institutional support from governments to think about the amount of water that's falling and, and what we're doing with it, which in most cases in urban environments is just dumping out into the ocean, which ends up having its own environmental toll. Yeah, I mean, one of the really tricky things about stormwater capture is that once the water makes contact with the urban environment, like pavements and roads and um, you know, it picks up a lot of contaminants. And so there's a big water quality issue with stormwater, you know, especially the water that's actually in the streets. And um, I think the city of Santa Monica has a really innovative program to treat stormwater and, and then inf re-infiltrate it back into the ground. But according to them, the stormwater is actually dirtier than the wastewater that's, that comes from people's really? oh, <laughs> homes, um, especially in that first storm, you know, where there's that first flush of all, the, all, all the, the, some, the accumulation of six right. months of grit and urban detritus. And so I think the water quality is a big issue. That's why it's doubly important for property owners to capture the stormwater when it's clean. You know, when it comes on a roof and, and goes into a gutter, right. especially after, you know, a few storms, it's actually really high quality water. And that's the time to infiltrate it. Stormwater is tricky. Uh, I think the water quality issue is, is something that, that needs, um, that's something that needs really serious infrastructure. And that's where we need to be integrating our water treatment facilities into stormwater capture. And that is happening, and there's a lot of innovation in that space in L.A. County, which is great. Yeah, and you do see, like, purple pipe water, the reclaimed water as well, um, both, you know, in some large spaces. I think of State Historic Park in downtown, which is all watered off of reclaimed water, purple pipe water. And then we've had a lot of gardens featured on the tour that are, you know, taking their dish water, their gray water, their water from their laundry to water plants, which also works really well. So there's a ton that can be done 
at many scales to to save water, to use the water that falls as rain, to reuse water that is being used for other purposes. And it's kind of fun, right? I mean, I think you're having fun, you know, moving water around on your property, right? It, it's not it doesn't have to be some onerous thing. It's kind of cool to move water around. Yeah, no, it is it is fun. I mean, I love storms. I love weather. So, and I like being out in weather. I'm, so I enjoy it. I'm, I don't know, not everyone does. Probably there needs to be systems that are available that are less DIY than, than what I do. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's a lot of fun and it's interesting. And it really does get you thinking about this precious resource that we have, which is water. And I do capture quite a lot of water, about a thousand gallons per inch of, of rain that falls is come, wow. comes into my garden. So it's quite a lot. But the idea is, you know, just to give the plants, even in a year when we don't get a lot of water and we do have a lot of variation from year to year and how much precipitation we get, But even in those lean years, the plants are getting more water than they would otherwise. And that makes the plants, you know, look a lot healthier and and be a lot more pleasing to people, which is, I think, one of the important attributes of of a native garden is that it also be appealing to people. So the plants are, you know, always looking good because they're always getting a lot of of water. It's got to look good. It's got to look good. (laughs) But, you know, importantly, it's coming at the time of year when the plants want the water. Um, which is in right. the winter and, and early spring, and it's not coming at the time of year when they when they don't want the water, which is our natural dry season in the summertime. Yeah, and that's a good a good point, and it's something that I I try to talk about a lot is that not all drought tolerant plants are created equal. When you kind of simplify what a drought tolerant plant is, and you say it takes X amount of water per year, that's not the full story because when seasonally is the water coming, and a lot of the drought tolerant plants that are being promoted right now actually like to be watered in the summer. So they're going to end up taking more water than their native counterparts because the natives want their uh, water in the wintertime. And I think it's really cool that you've figured out how to save water uh, on your landscape and use it to basically get the plants primed for the dry season. It makes me think, outside of just your garden, why don't we do this in a much larger way here in Southern California? Do you have any thoughts on water capture basically as a way to mitigate you know the dwindling resources of water that we have in in california well southern california was set up basically the early 20th century to be a place where all the water that we use is imported from other places and all the water that we get in the form of rain is you know sloughed off to the ocean and so you know it's this kind of bizarre situation where we actually do you know it's a mediterranean climate we get a healthy amount of, of rainfall in the wintertime, um, but none of that rainfall is actually used. And that system has enabled this very strange set of landscaping practices where, you know, people just plant whatever they want because there's this seemingly unlimited water supply from elsewhere to sustain plants, you know, even in the summertime when we don't naturally get water. Native plants are really important for water conservation because it gets us in sync with the natural cycles. It gets our gardens to be in sync with the natural cycles of precipitation. And so local water capture is, is a really key element of that. And one way people can contribute to local water capture is by um, making sure that the, what, what falls onto their roofs is actually um, either stored or infiltrated into the ground. And that's a, something that I think it can be daunting to think I'm going to tie my gutters into an elaborate system of barrels and then dole that out throughout the season. And I don't want to deter people from doing that because that's a wonderful thing to do. And and you can use that water and and get a massive amount of water. I have a friend who has a 800 gallon system and a a pretty small roof connected to it. And within like 24 hours of one storm, the entire thing was filled. So it's pretty significant how much water can be saved, but also just putting it back in the ground is a huge boon. Have you done that on your property and how do you How do you move water around in your garden? I have a a kind of MacGyvered system of hoses. (laughs) So I attach these hoses to the barrel, and as the barrel fills up with water from the gutter, you know, gravity pushes the water out into the garden, and and the hoses distribute it. And I move the hoses around, you know, so certain plants get more or less, depending on whether I want them to to get more water or less. You know, that's that's a way of replenishing the groundwater, and especially the deeper layers of of the soil— because as the summertime dry season rolls around, you're giving these plants, um, who usually have a pretty deep taproot, access to moisture in the summertime, and that keeps them looking good for longer. You know, we do have a lean season in the summertime when we don't have a lot of precipitation, and a lot of the plants have a strategy for dealing with that, which is to maybe lose some of their leaves or... or Hunker down. Hunker down, yeah, exactly. And that's not as attractive to people, and a garden in a urban environment needs to be attractive. So 
the advantage of infiltrating like that and, and replenishing these deeper soil layers is that you give the taproot of the plant the you know access to water in the summertime and and allow it to keep keep on you know keep on looking good for a little longer. Yeah, and I think that's that's brilliant. And you are right that our gardens you know the, there's a different kind of aesthetic bar that's set for them. One of the questions I get a lot from people is, are there plants that can survive with no water? And my answer is always, well, yeah, go hiking, right? Every plant outside of the city is surviving with no water. And they might not look as good in the summer, you know, depending on your aesthetics. I happen to think that browns and yellows can be quite beautiful, but others maybe not so much. But Basically, what we're talking about is water and seasonality, and that's really the thing that native plants do outside of, you know, to differentiate them from the larger kind of broader category of, of low water plants is they are conditioned to the specific seasons that we have. Um, we're recording this in mid-January. It's a beautiful day. The birds are chirping. We're here at Theodore Payne Foundation, and we've actually had a pretty good rain here so far, which is interesting because... You know, everyone was saying this is not going to be a good year. We're, we're in for years of drought and we're on the heels of a, of a really bad rain year the year before. And I know that you and your work model and predict how large scale environmental forces are going to come to play and, you know, what what is going to happen with the climate, what might happen with with all these other um, elements of the environment. But I'm a layperson when it comes to the science behind all this stuff. And there are things that I don't really understand. I'd love to get your feedback on of, of kind of how how do we predict annual rainfall, I should say, in, in Southern California? And there's a lot of terminology that's thrown around that I think you could just sort of enlighten us on. So I'm going to throw out a couple of terms. Maybe you could just tell me and tell our audience like what these things are and how they're kind of used to think about what's happening and what might happen now and then going forward into the future. So the terms that I would love to have a better understanding of, El Nino and La Nina, Atmospheric River and Pineapple Express. What are those things? Okay, well, I'll start with um, Atmospheric River and Pineapple Express, which are two words for the same thing. You know, in the wet season, um, which is the winter time, we get these big rivers of of moisture that are in the air um, from the tropical Pacific. Rivers in the air. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, and they actually, you know, the, the reason why they, that that term is applied is because they contain a huge amount of um, flow of water. If you compared it to an actual river like the Mississippi, it might be a few times the flow in the Mississippi River. Wow. So they're really, it's really a lot of moisture. You know, it's like, it's sort of like this big hose flipping around in the Pacific that's just hosing the mountains of California and producing a lot of precipitation in the state um, when they occur. Um, and they've, you know, they've also been called pineapple expresses because they come from the, you know, the land of the pineapples, the, you know, the, the tropics. Okay, that makes sense. So it's, it's basically this evaporation happening in the tropics and then it's getting routed towards California and just dumping rain this is, as has happened here. Yeah, I mean the tropics are just the engine of the whole, you know, cycling of water in the atmosphere and these atmospheric rivers are the main source of moisture for not only California but all of the mid and high latitudes of the planet. But we happen to be positioned where they often hit a coast and when you have mountains and an atmospheric river you get a lot of precipitation because that moist air is forced to flow up over the mountains and that produces that uplift produces precipitation so we have a huge amount of precipitation when we have an atmospheric river occurring i like that you're foreshadowing the mountains because we're going to be getting into how landforms and the atmosphere they all kind of work together in this complex system to produce the conditions that we see on the ground here um I still don't know what really La Nina and El Nino are. Could you just give a really quick cliff note description of those things? So in the tropical Pacific, there's huge variability from year to year in the climate. And that variability has um, been called El Nino and La Nina. Those are the two different phases of the variations. And so when it's really warm in the eastern tropical Pacific, that's called an El Nino. And when it's cold, that's a La Nina. And there is an association between the tropical Pacific conditions and the precipitation, especially in Southern California. The association is actually pretty weak, but when we do have a, a big El Nino, that's more often than not associated with a big rain year. And so 82, 83, that was a big El Nino, 97, 98, those were big El Nino years, and people who have some longevity might remember those big events. Um, you know, they produced a lot of precipitation in, in California. I like to think of El Nino and La Nina as kind of stacking the dice a little bit. So when there is, a, say, a La Nina, that does stack the dice in favor of a relatively dry year. 
But that doesn't always happen. And we have, in the past, had La Nina years that are associated with a lot of precipitation. And that's actually kind of what's happening now. You know, we have La Nina conditions in the tropical Pacific, but so far we've had a bonanza of you know, right. the first half of the wet year has been, been really um, it's been good. <laughs> really good. So, you know, it's, it's not an ironclad rule that the tropical Pacific um, really dictates what the precipitation is in California. It's more like it changes the chances. And unfortunately, in the, in the media, you know, when there's a La Nina or an El Nino, there's a tendency to sensationalize, you know, the impacts of that. And people get excited about, oh, there's an El Nino or a La Nina, and it's going to be another dry year or it's going to be another really wet year. So we just have to be careful. You know, it, it, it doesn't guarantee that we're going to have heavy, heavy precipitation or light precipitation or, or drought, you know, in California. It's just, a, it's just a relationship that stacks the dice in favor of one or the other. I'm thinking about the uh, Saturday Night Live Chris Farley character. I am El Nino. In Spanish, it means the Nino. <laughs> yeah. All tropical storms must bow before me. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. been popularized in a way that, that um, might not be productive for people's understanding of how it actually works. <laughs> right. Well, that's really helpful and interesting to note, you know, how other parts of the world really influence our climate here, which then in turn influence the plants and the vegetation. For each of our five episodes, we've asked a different member of the Theodore Payne Foundation staff to pick a plant that reminds them of that theme and describe it. Hello, everyone. My name is Sester, and I work in the nursery here at TPF. When it comes to finding water, tree roots are great teachers. Some of our plant relatives have very deep root system that thrive where other species wouldn't even have a chance. This is the case with Parkinsonia florida, commonly known as blue palo verde. Its name means green stick in Spanish, which fits perfectly because it is exactly how this tree looks. The trunk and branches are bright green and smooth to the touch. The leaves are so small and oval that they almost go unnoticed because they are the same color as the rest of the tree. When spring comes and palo verde blooms, the tree fills up with yellow flowers that are full of nectar and becomes an spectacular floral show accompanied by buzzing sounds of all kinds. The seed pods hanging on the tree are an important source of food for indigenous people and wildlife. Sweet and nutritious gift of the desert. The next time you come to visit the foundation, don't forget to take a time to admire the blue palo verde inside the nursery. So it's really incredible how these things happening in far off places influence the rain that falls here. And as a horticulturist, the rain that falls here, I think is the best thing you can possibly use to water your plants, you know, immeasurably better than tap water or whatever municipal water source you're using. And I know there's some interesting kind of science behind how rain is even formed to begin with. Do you have any kind of thoughts on that, Alex? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. There's been some recent studies about what's actually in rain. <laughs> and there are raindrops that have been falling on, on California that have been studied. And, and it turns out that they have dust and minerals and biology in them from other places as far away as even um, Africa. Wow. Um, there's a lot of material in, in rainfall that you know may be beneficial to plants and may actually be enriching. And then you know, there's the pH of the rainfall is also much healthier for plants. And then we might also add that tap water is treated for human health purposes and has things like chloramine in it that kill biology, including biology in soils. Um, and that's very detrimental to plants. So there are lots of reasons why rainwater is better than tap water. And, you know, when we irrigate, if you can irrigate with captured stormwater, that's going to be a lot healthier for your plants than, than tap water. You know, years ago, working in a greenhouse in Boston, and it was a research greenhouse, very particular kind of requirements for the plants, and I was there to take care of the plants, and we, we had to do all this elaborate way of treating the tap water to change the pH and to deal with the chloramine, which, which is not good for biology, as you said. Like, you, you can't just use tap water in a fish tank. Uh, and, and aquatic plants don't do well with tap water, so it stands to reason that even if plants can survive this type of water, it's not the best for them. And so, yeah, rainwater is the way to go when it comes to watering plants. Um, I, I totally agree with that. 
I want to jump back for one second into what's in a raindrop because it's you know amazing and beautiful to think of dust particles from Africa falling here in California. I think we'll get into this a little more in our episode on air, but there's another element to rainfall, which is that it's actually dropping particulate pollutants down on our soil. There's this process called nitrogen deposition that basically when the rain falls, it's adding nutrients to the soil, which is changing the soil chemistry, which often is disadvantageous to native plants and it's advantageous to the non-native European annual grasses. So uh, sorry to be the bummer here, Alex. But you're, just... you're, you're literally getting into the weeds here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is the weeds. Um, but I think it's interesting and important way to think about what's happening is that there, there are all these factors that go into a single raindrop and, and what that's doing to the soil sometimes good, sometimes bad. So we're going to end on the good. And we're going to talk about what's happening this year. Again, we're in January. We don't know how the rest of the year is going to play out, but it's looking like we might have a really good spring. And every springtime that we get this type of regular steady rain at consistent intervals, we have this amazing phenomenon of the mass annual blooms or the super bloom. Have you been out to experience any of those in, in person, Alex? I experienced one in Death Valley a few years ago, Aaron. That was just an just a magical experience to see this, you know, completely desiccated landscape become so full of life. I mean, that was just an incredible experience. And I think we are on track to have a really great year for wildflowers in Southern California. And that's just really exciting. You know, we have this incredible variability from year to year in rainfall and precipitation, and that creates surprises. Sometimes right. we get a really good wildflower season, um, and that's one of the you know, exciting, delightful things about living here is that sometimes we get to experience that. One of the things that I always think about when I see a super bloom, but even when you're not seeing a super bloom, is that everything that was needed to create that incredible, dense, mass display of wildflowers was already there. All of the seeds were already in the soil. They were under the earth. And that's a good segue, I think, to what we'll be talking about in our next episode, which is the earth and the soil, what lies beneath the landforms that shape climate, that shape precipitation and water flows. So thank you all for joining us for this episode about water. We have more to go. We're going to be diving deep in Alex's garden for different elements of, of his garden. Alex, do you have any closing thoughts on water? You know, my neighbors think I'm crazy because I'm always out there in storms, you know, looking at my rain barrels and seeing how they're performing, and I am a little obsessive about it. Um, but it's really taught me to care about water and to think about how hard it is to work with water um, in a place like California where we have these wild swings between wet and dry years, and when the water does come, it comes... Um, maybe in the space of one or two hours, we'll get a lot of precipitation, you know. And the work that I've done to try to manage my own water has really given me an appreciation for the resource. And I think that's one of the main benefits in a way is, is I had this deeper understanding of how water actually works in this place. It really is incredible and it's such a precious resource. And one of the great beauties of native plants is that you can both save water and restore habitat at the same time. So thanks, Alex, for joining. We're, we're going to jump into earth for our next episode of elements of a garden so for those of you who are looking to find the best wild flowers in southern california check out the theodore Payne foundation wildflower hotline where you'll get a weekly update on the best places to view wildflowers throughout southern california you can also find in a podcast form on any of your favorite podcast platforms and each week, we'll give you a curated guide to the best wildflower viewing in Southern California. 